Howdy, everybody. Yeah, so uh, thank you, David. That was, that was wonderful. I thought you'd be up here for a little longer, but um, it's okay. Anyway, I, I, I kind of put together this, this uh, interesting show for you guys, something we haven't really done before, which is um, I hope you're okay with the way we're going to do this. I, I wanted to present you more of a, more of a, uh, uh, a walkthrough of creativity rather than just showing slide after slide. We have plenty of slides to show, but I, I just wanted to see if that would be okay with you guys. I wanted to kind of get into your head a little bit and, and kind of give you a little uh, entree into the way that I think about making photographs and taking photographs, and then also about process. I think process uh, for me has always been kind of the, uh, the kickoff. Like I, uh, I was a, a teenager in Houston, Texas, and I set up a dark room in, in my, uh, my parents' bathroom, and I, I just loved making prints, but I really didn't even care about taking pictures. And it wasn't until I was in college uh, in my junior year that I sort of stumbled on documentary photography and realized that uh, I had an affinity for uh, storytelling. And so that, that really brought me into starting my journey in editorial. And the first time I dropped off my book for an assignment was to a magazine by the name of Avenue Magazine in New York. And uh, I remember the, you can, hey Rachel, you can, you can hold for one second. And uh, the editor-in-chief, uh, who I won't mention his name because it's not very nice to say things about people unless they're very nice things, uh, <laughs> he, he, he left me a note. I was, I, you know, I was really excited because this is my first time to do it, and I, I get the note. I get the, the book back, and there's a note inside by the editor-in-chief, and it says, Dear Mark, thank you for dropping off your portfolio. Uh, you have some very serviceable, serviceable pictures here, but I don't see any personal style. And it, it said, thank you for dropping off your book, and good luck, basically. And I thought, oh, well, that's bad. And the next time I sent my book out was a couple of days later after I was licking my wounds and uh, put it back out there, and I got a job at Forbes magazine to do a portrait. And so that's things started to roll. But I realized that, um, you know, personal style is kind of a, in my, word, in my opinion, is a, uh, a, a non-functioning word for me. It doesn't really do anything for me. Because I, actually, if you think about it, if I think about my work, I really don't have a personal style. I have imagery that I want to take. And I, I'm a photographer. Uh, I think of myself as an artist. I don't really want to go out and take the same picture over and over and over again. So what I put together for you today is kind of a, a talk, uh, and, and we'll get down to some questions if you guys are interested at the very end, but a talk about um, imagination, right? Your imagination is limitless. Everything you experience is fair game in how an idea is formed. A movie? A piece of music, a walk on the street, even people watching adds to your intelligence and helps fill up the filing cabinets of creativity. Now, I'm not saying that your equipment and your gear is not a great additive to the process, but I am a firm believer that it starts with an idea. Now, let's say that you're assigned a portrait or a story. Do you go to a session without preemptively knowing something about your subject? No. I've often said that it is your responsibility to fall in love with your subject. Obviously, I mean that metaphorically, but not only will it help to conceive an idea, but it will also help to navigate a conversation with your subject and move the session into a place of confidence. Remember, Having your picture taken is a very unnatural experience for most. And so your ability to communicate well and put your subject at ease will help, create, will help direct them to patiently meeting 
your vision. Now, when we think about that, right, like we, go, we approach a subject, we approach an idea to a portrait. Are we telling their story or are we telling our story? And that is what you are confronted with. And as a photographer, you make the decision, do I walk in there and do a picture or do I have an idea behind something that I want to do and do I need to somehow collaborate with this person that I'm working with? Now that can be in many different forms. That can be in a very theatrical way or that can be in a very simplistic way. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about how we create an idea. Is that okay? Okay, cool. How to prepare to create an idea. See, basic shit here. Number one, who is the person I'm photographing? What is the project that they are promoting? What does the past work represent? Number two, what's the destination? Where am I? Am I in a daylight studio? Am I on a rooftop? Or am I in some fabulous location? And then number three, am I asking them to play a character or simplifying it to just a portrait? <clears throat> so, that's kind of the beginning of the way I start. Then we go to making a list. Now this is something that I've been doing for years and years and years. I start with just a blank piece of paper. And I've done my research, I've thought about this person or this situation, whether it's a portrait or fashion story or, you know, documentary thing, and I try to figure out, like, what, what it is that I want to tell, the story I want to tell. So I'm making a list of everything that comes to mind. And after you've done the research and you make the second list of ideas, you make a second list of ideas that are antithetical to your first ideas. Then you go back over the two columns and you start crossing everything out that feels uninteresting or impossible. Then look at that list again and maybe keep a few impossibilities because you, ne you never know and everything is possible. Now that you have your short list of ideas, and I mean maybe a half dozen or so, try sketching them out. Again, asking the question, where am I? And by drawing out your ideas, you will start to build the storytelling. Now comes the fun part. How the hell am I going to pull this off? It's probably the most common question that I ask myself. And typically, I will enlist the support of talented stylists, hair and makeup artists, location scouts, and assistants. <clears throat> there could also be a set of designers, a set designer, a prop stylist to boot. Lastly, are there any extras? Once this idea is formed and in motion, then the gear comes next. All I can say is that feel free to experiment, but also keep things simple so not to be bogged down by tedious, unnecessary weight. <clears throat> Let the idea be the hero. So, very simple idea. Does anybody know what this picture is? This is a picture I did of Nirvana, actually of Kurt Cobain. So if you go back, Rachel, I had very crudely created a little mock-up of something that probably I'd only understand, which was this shrine with baby doll heads and something that I thought resembled Kurt Cobain, but I don't really think so. And I built it while they were, they were on tour, and I built it in a little studio that we set up to photograph them when we had an hour, an hour and a half. So that was the first, uh, that was one of my first drawings that I did early on. This is, uh, uh, so I had an idea for Whoopi Goldberg because of her hair. So I drew, kind of drew this out, and of course I showed it to her, and she was like, is this really me? And uh, I said, absolutely not. This is, this is my, my idea of you. So she did not hesitate and let me pin her hair up on a piece of, of uh, foam cord. 
This is for, um, what's a band? Why am I spacing here? Yes, thank you. So we go to the actual photograph. The next one? This is for Conan O'Brien. Now, this was a little tricky because I always thought that he looked like Kip's Big Boy. I grew up in Texas, and we had lots of them. So I thought his hair was kind of Kip's Big Boy. So we had to actually have a model made of the body, and then I had to find a diner that we could shoot it at, and then he met me at the diner, and we put the two together. So. <laughs> next. So this is a, a, my version of what I was going to do for a cover for Rolling Stone. Now, I, I didn't know it was going to be a gatefold, but I figured if I made it big enough and, and, and wild enough that they'd probably do a gatefold. So this was the cover. And this was for a GQ magazine uh, shooting J-Lo. And I had this idea because she has this very sort of epic back, as we say. And um, I thought it'd be really cool if there was like an artist who we cast, and we sh built this artist studio, Northlight Studio, in my studio, inside of my studio. So the studio inside of a studio. So here's the image that we came up with. I actually wanted to get more back in that, but she was not as comfortable as I was. And so this was uh, a series of images I did of Will Ferrell. And the, 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 we used Will in, as the, uh, the ancillary characters within that. But this one, we actually did not use Will. We just used an ancillary character. <laughs> and we're going to get back into a little bit about comedy in a second, but I wanted to show you sort of the, the way that I start in the process of when I'm making a photograph and how I draw things out. And this is Barat. <laughs> and Demi Moore, this was for the cover of uh, Harper's Bazaar magazine. So this was actually on a beach in Los Angeles. And um, we built Basically, we built this kind of staircase. So this, we, we found the staircase, but we built this set, and then we brought a giraffe onto the set, and we did this, this photograph with her. So I want to read you a quote. When I was starting out, one of the things that I played with was the idea of kind of simplicity and listening to... Um, listening to a photograph coming to me rather than me creating a, a, an image. And uh, kind of mid-career, I started to be a little bit disappointed with the work that I was doing when I was just setting up photograph. And so I started to work on this project, which was uh, kind of more formal in terms of uh, the content, which was landscapes. And if you'll hold on, Rachel, one second. Landscapes, nudes, and still lifes. And so before I started, I remembered a quote by Minor White. When you approach something to photograph it, first be still with yourself until the object of your attention affirms your presence. Then don't leave until you have captured its essence. Now, I stepped out on a New Year's Day. It was a particularly warm day uh, in New York City across from my place on, in the West Village. And there was this beautiful low-lying fog, as you see in this picture, uh, in these piers that no longer exist. And I remember taking my 4x5 out and kind of huffing over there to get the, the last light. And I set up, and I was shooting multiple exposures with a 4x5. And as I was wrapping up, I looked behind me, and there was 25 people standing behind me. And what that did tell me was that what I was seeing was pretty exquisite and that people were also noticing it. Our ability to see things that others may not observe is an acquired vision drawn from awareness. My first experience with this was handed down to be me by my brother Frank, 
who suggested that I take pictures at night because of the contrast of shadows. Shape, form was exaggerated by incandescent lighting. I had to trust that my long exposures were accurate, and lo and behold, I started to see things differently. So this is a series, really me kind of bending the lines of formal photography, but really starting with um, platinum palladium printing and adjusting the material that I wanted to shoot in order to accommodate the printing. And this was the cover of the book called Listen. These are some other additional images that we put in that was from a book that I did over uh, the lockdown, which is of New York City. So this gives you kind of an example of kind of what I call us listening to photographs. This is a snowstorm on Coney Island. Again, Coney Island. So what, what I did with my brother Frank, when we, when we started to work on this little project of seeing, if you go back one, is that, well, I'm using the same formula, right? Like, I, I'm eliminating all other sensory to focus on the idea of anything within a black, of, of contrast, basically, of white and black. And as you see in the landscape, there is a definitive composition really brought to you really through only the blacks and the whites. The grays are really inconsequential. This is a modern day project I'm working on. I threw this in because this is something I'm toying with where I'm doing multiple exposures on a four by five sheet of film. So I'm starting with clouds and then I'm photographing my subject, and then I'm going out and I'm photographing some kind of piece of architecture and seeing where it all lands on the piece of film. I'm not trying to line things up. I'm trying to have a little bit of a, a spontaneous experience within these. And then we're, photo and then we're printing these on paper, black and white, silver, and then also platinum. Again, during the lockdown. Again, during the lockdown. Again, this was for listen. So a funny story about this. The reason why I threw this in there, because I don't really think about this as a portrait. I think about this as more like a still life. And the reason why is because I don't think you think about necessarily about just his face, maybe his eyes being almost like objects. But the idea that the adornment on this man's face is really an object. So I was at a Jane's Addiction concert, and I was going to the restroom, and I see the sea of people open up, and here's this guy walking through. People were terrified of him. And I ran over to him, and I said, oh, man, here's my card. I'd love to take a picture of you. And I was a little nervous, but he looked at me and kind of thought for a second. He goes like, oh, my name's Dennis. Uh, I could use a headshot. So <laughs> hey, you never know, right? Again, this is from the triple exposure. So that, that was really a phase for me back in probably 2010, when I was kind of reconnecting with more basic ideas of photography. Over the years, I've always put a, a pretty big effort in creating my own uh, personal work and stories and things that interest me. And I wanted to read you a quote by Henri Cartier-Bresson. Photographer, photographers deal in things which are continually vanishing. And when they have vanished, there is no contrivance on earth which can make them come back again. The next body of work that I'm going to talk about really deals with the idea of things that were interesting to me that I noticed were going to be vanishing. And I'll explain that as we go through the work. My personal work or self-assigned projects 
are usually split down the middle in terms of coming to fruition. Once again, I start with a destination, and I will experiment with what tools make most sense in accomplishing a striking image. The final outcome is, of course, the print. Like Brisson's quote informs us, a moment is a vanishing paradox that is seemingly contradictory and opposed to common sense, yet perhaps true. These moments are lost as soon as they happen, but through photography they serve as a record of acknowledgement of time and place. The worst picture I ever took, the worst picture I ever took was the one I never went out and did. What I mean by that is when times I felt as if I had failed were the times when I didn't seize the moment. Every person we meet, no matter of age, place, commonality, or familiarity, has a story to tell. So if you start back at this body of work, is this the first slide? No. Okay, if we can start back on this. My, in 1996, I decided, I grew up Jewish, reform, um, sorry, B&H, um, <laughs> in uh, Houston, Texas, in Houston, Texas. And, um, you know, we were taught in our Sabbath school about the Holocaust, obviously, like, you know, all good Jewish kids. But I never really had an experience with a survivor until I went to a bakery with my parents that we used to go to to pick up our challah and our bagels. And I noticed one day when we were there that one of the gentlemen, the older gentleman behind the counter, who was one of the three brothers that owned the bakery, had a tattoo on his arm. And I realized that he was a survivor. And then I met his other two brothers who were also survivors. And it was really disturbing to me. And when I finally felt like I had something to say as a photographer, and somebody approached me about a book, I worked with a, a wonderful writer by the name of Leora Kahn, and we came up with this idea of doing a, a book sharing stories and photographs, modern day photographs, of survivors. And so these are the three brothers. So I went back to Houston and I photographed the three brothers together. Uh, which was pretty joyous for me to be able to do that. And you, as you go along, you'll see some of the imagery of some of the other survivors that we included in the book. And you can start, Rachel. These were actually Mingala twins. So they were, when they were uh, uh, in, in, in prison, uh, the doc, Dr. Mingala and his crew operated on them and performed experiments on twins, and they were involved in, in that experiment. Now, I don't think that's the reason why she's in a wheelchair. I think, she, unfortunately, a different fate uh, came upon her, but uh, just wonderful brother and sister. This is a, a, a four-day trip to Cuba where I just went with a, found a, a, a little wagon and brought a bunch of equipment and brought my assistant with me, met a translator, and we just walked on the streets of Havana and took pictures. Now, this guy was asleep on a hammock when we were walking through these apartment buildings. And uh, my translator woke him up and said, like, hey, we'd like to take a picture. And he had really long hair. And he goes, like, oh, one second. And he ran upstairs, and he was gone for like half an hour. I go, this guy coming back? I think, I think so. Came back, and he had his little Richard hair on. So this is, uh, I think, one of the more successful images. Anyway, So if you look at this last image, I was on my way back to New York after I did this last picture. This picture planted a seed in my head. I was so taken back by the theater at this burlesque show. 
and how welcoming uh, the performers were, I thought to myself, wow, I'm, this feels really familiar. And I live right near Christopher Street. And for years, I've avoided that street because of the theater. It was always just so loud and crazy. But I did really love like getting up at 8 o'clock in the morning and going outside and seeing like the theater continuing on my block. And it was just like street walkers and performers and all kinds of stuff going on. And so I started to think about a vanishing Christopher Street. And I went out and I took these pictures of some of the street walkers and some of the people. Now, not all, obviously, not all of them are street walkers, but I got to know some of the characters, and they said, you know, this is a, a changing landscape. Christopher Street was kind of our Ellis Island, and it turned into be a transgender book. And I worked on the project for three summers, and it came out, I think, in 2016. And these are, these are some of the pictures I took in my own backyard, just in summertime and in the fall. So everything is the opposite of what you see in terms of gender. So the simple portrait. I want to read you a quote by Richard Avedon, because I think this is important. You know. You guys, it, it can be really intimidating looking at work that's had 30 years of brush strokes on it, right? And you go, wow, how do you, do, how do you even start? Well, then I'm giving you a little piece of that. But I want to also interject the idea that, you know, there is a period when you're working and you're thinking that you can simplify it. And by the idea of simplifying a portrait doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be less impactful, but it, it's going to be an easier sort of navigation in terms of being able to find something that you're really pleased with. Richard Avedon said, I worked out a series of no's. No to exquisite light, no to apparent compositions, no to the seduction of poses and narrative, and all these no forces me to yes. I have a white background, I have the person that I'm interested in, and the thing that happens between us. A simple portrait can be the most difficult to pull off. I've spent more time, this is me actually, I've spent more time carving out the shape of a modifier in a situation like this than actually setting up a big production. Much of my prep is preemptively testing, whoop, did I just do something? Much of my prep is preemptively testing my lighting so that my subject is not waiting around through the process. However, I will take the time to change the shape or even change the light if I feel it will make a better picture. So that's another, that's another you know, tool in our toolbox that we have to remember, that not everything needs to be a big production. Now, what is a kind of a big production, but I think very interesting production, is the idea of comedy. Now, comedy is something, if you look at my work and you go, like, God, this guy really doesn't have any personal style, that I really don't. I mean, I, I, I like serious shit. I like funny stuff. I've always been drawn to humor. I've loved, you know, I learned a lot of humor and the idea of, of what's going on? I've, I've learned a lot about it, uh, taking funny pictures by studying silent movies and by working with comedians. Now, comedians tend to guide the conversation uh, 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 where they want to go. But I always try to come with ideas before they give me their ideas. So this is the exception to the rule. Will Farrell, after giving him 100 ideas, he and his um, manager came back and said, well, Will has an idea. And I go like, well, what's that? And he goes like, Will giving birth to a chimp. I said, great. I like the idea. Let's do it. So he found an old hospital in LA, uh, recruited my assistant uh, to become Planet of the Apes, and uh, my friend Gay Bartolis, who's an incredible prosthetic uh, artist, helped me carve out uh, these prosthetics for their faces, and we did this picture. This was one of the first times I worked with 
Julia Louise Dreyfus and Jerry Seinfeld. And I found out that Jerry was a big fan of Harry Langdon. And so I studied a lot of the silent movies, be able to propose this idea, and this idea came to me and I did it and we did it together. I don't know why I came up with this. I just think Melissa McCarthy is like such an awesome human being and she's got such, you know, chutzpah in everything she does. So uh, I just thought she would be, you know, the great Troy, woman of Troy. And again, I'm thinking very antithetical, antithetical uh, when I did this picture. Uh, uh, Jonah Hill, uh, that, you know, he was like, kind of like a, my idea of a Playboy bunny. <laughs> now, who doesn't want to go see a cabaret with uh, Amy Schumer and uh, Stormtroopers? So this is a whole thing that we did on uh, kind of a parody of Star Wars. I have no idea. I just... <laughs> came to me that Steve Carell should be in a baby crib <laughs> screaming his head off in a onesie. <laughs> Tiffany Haddish having steak at a John George restaurant with her two poodles. I don't know. It, and she said, you know, when I told her the idea, she was like, yeah, I love bitches. Very early on, working with Drew Barrymore, who has been an incredible muse over the year, I had a series of images, and one of them was the idea of her ball dancing with a sumo wrestler. Chris Rock as Jimi Hendrix. I, I, I'm not quite sure. This is kind of funny because I had, I had made this outfit for Robin Williams and we were, we were kind of getting the idea ready on the first day. We had him for two half days and we had a weekend in between. And he walked over and he saw this set and he took the shoes that I had for the costume and he gets on his knees and he put them on his feet and he goes like, to loose for Trek. And so we ran out and we got this costume made and we made him to loose for Trek. That was done by a lot of peanut butter and not a very, not a real happy Larry. <laughs> Even though that's not unexpected. This was a big cover for me for Rolling Stone because this was the, kind of the breakthrough of Friends. And we wanted to, to figure out a way to kind of incorporate all these people in a very like hyperactive, great retro feel. So I used Rockwell as kind of an inspiration. Very last portrait of the day with Eddie Murphy. And he kind of didn't want to do this, and I just sort of squeezed it out of him, and he gave me these two beautiful faces. Somehow we talked our way into the Mu Museum of Natural History to do this. I think we had like 30 minutes in the morning on a Monday morning when it wasn't open. And uh, we were able to get in and do this picture with Alec Baldwin for a story of him for Vanity Fair. So, um, last thing that we go into are, uh, are, are, are basically, I kind of jumped the gun, but these are the simple portraits. So, I'm going to kind of let you guys, because we're running out a little bit of time here, but I'm going to let you guys sort of understand how I approach a simple portrait. If you go back one, I ended up doing a full shoot with John Lee Hooker, and the first thing that he said to me when I met him was, feel my hands, they feel just like velvet. And they did, they were just this soft and this beautiful and so much character. And I went all day and I did all these other pictures and I went back to my hotel and I realized he had given me the biggest clue that his hands were a piece of art. So I called him up and I told him, I said, man, I think I might have screwed up some of the film. I'm wondering if I can come back for a half an hour and do a picture in the morning. And he let me come over. I had to set up in his driveway. He's like, you can't come in my house. I was like, all right. Set up in his driveway. 
And I did um, probably 10 sheets of film. And this, this is one of the pictures I got. Misty Copeland. This is uh, really funny. You, go, you, you, know, you look at stuff and you go like, wow, how did you light that? So I call this prison lighting. Literally, it's two light bulbs from the hardware store with you know, like work lights, and then six on my background, and that's it, and an 8x10 view camera. But it's not about trickery, it's not about lighting, it's, not, it's all about how you sort of like solve the problem. Johnny Cash, again shot in a hotel room. That's Zoe, that's prison lighting. This picture I knew that I wanted to take, but I didn't know how I was going to get around an entire rose garden full of editors and White House people. And I'd done, I had six minutes with the president. I'd already done the cover. And I knew I just had a couple of minutes. And I said, Mr. President, I want to do a little, little piece of art on you. And he goes like, sure. I'm, I'm into that. And I said, I want to do a diptych. I want to do the front and I want to do the back. We'll do it really quick. And I'd set up a white background, nine foot background in the, in the rose garden, right? And I look and everybody's wondering what I'm doing. Like I'm kind of going rogue now. And I do the portrait of him in front, right? And they're like, oh, okay, just chill out. And all of a sudden, I say, okay, let's do the back. Turns around, flips around. And I go, uh, put your hands in your pocket. And he goes, okay. By this time, everybody in the White House is like starting to freak out. <laughs> and I go, okay, just your elbows. He adjusts his elbows. Okay, okay, good. Smile. <laughs> okay, that's enough art. Three frames were out of focus, but the one frame that you saw was tight. So, got there. Again, Brad Pitt with prison lighting. This is a book I did called In My Stairwell. The reason I brought this in is because this was a place that I found when I moved into my studio in 97, and it was an old elevator shaft that we converted into a stairwell. And at the very top of it had this beautiful north light window that I thought, wow, this would be a beautiful destination for portraits. And it kind of started to do portraits in there. And then it turned into a series. And then it turned into a book and an exhibition and traveled to museums. And anyway, Mary J. Blige, another prison lighting of Snoop doing what he does. <laughs> awesome. Uh, this was shot on a piece of 665 Polaroid film, so I got a negative. And I shot all this film afterwards, and nothing compared to that first moment that his guard was down. And then two months later, he, he, was, he was gone. The great Tony Bennett, prison lighting. That's in the, in the stairwell. This is a prison line. This is a recent picture I did of Mr. De Niro. Kendrick. Sir Ian McKellen. Prison lighting with Misha Barishnikov. Drew, one of my muses. Judy Dench. Dalai Lama, real quick story, Dalai Lama, right? Dalai Lama had a hundred monks with him during this seminar he was giving, a prayer seminar. And I had 10 minutes in a basement in Washington. They said, head, head monk goes, don't ask him to take his watch off. Do not ask him to take his glasses off. Do not shake his hand. I go, okay. I'm okay with that. I don't need to. Keep his glasses on, damn. So he comes up, they introduce the Dalai Lama. First thing he does is like, how, how are you? <laughs> I go, you mind taking your glasses and your watch off? <laughs> I'm just that guy, right? Like I'm that guy you don't tell not to do something because I will fucking ask you to do it. <laughs> 
So originally when I talked to David, who David Bromer, who you guys know, and B&H, and I want to thank everybody. This is going to kind of wind it down a little bit. Uh, thank you guys for, obviously, for coming out. And David and B&H, thank you guys for having us. Um, we've got uh, um, Rachel Crow from the studio over here and uh, Maddie and Sky from the studio here, and just want to thank you guys. But I'm going to finish up. This is a project I've been working on for 10 years. No earthly idea going to shoot the Oscar party in the middle of the Vanity Fair party where they said, okay, just set up a background and shoot some portraits. We'll bring people in. I was like, for what? For, for, the, for Instagram. I was going, Instagram? Are you kidding me? I'm not putting my work on Instagram. I maybe had like 1,500 followers. I woke up the morning after the first year and I had 37,000. I was like, oh, I guess people really like this thing, Instagram. <laughs> so we kept doing it. And every year we get a little bit more innovative with the, with the theater of the set. And I was working with my dear friend Thomas Thurnauer who would help me construct these. We'd spend probably two months prior to coming up with an idea and then flushing them out with the magazine and eventually kind of putting it to, to test. So these are all shot during the Vanity Fair party and people, really tiny crew, and people go out and try to pull people out of the party to come in and be photographed. And so after 10 years, we're doing a book and it's coming out in November. So this is the... the body of the 10 years of, of work. That's where we start. That's kind of our destination. Now, this is about 15 by about 25, this room. And it's all contained in the back of the party. So if you go back, you'll see the sketch, and then you'll see Lady Gaga on the steps. And she was one of the last people that came in that night, especially just to be photographed. So this is when she won. This gives you a little sample of everything through the years in terms of building. This was a, kind of a Zen tea house that was our inspiration. And then we, we kind of created these rooms in different areas to be able to photograph in. It was last year. It was last year. So the last thing I wanted to show you, and I guys want, want you to kind of end on a, this is a, a moving portrait that I put together. I've done uh, a dozen of them, a little bit over a dozen of them, and I haven't shown them publicly, but this is kind of our, kind of our post-talk meditation. So I just kind of want you guys to meditate. It's isolation means it's kind of your interior thoughts. For me, your interior thoughts where you go, where you kind of find your inspiration, where you find your fears, and kind of walking through it. Anyway, I'll let you guys just have a moment of meditation on this.
All right. Thank you, guys.